June 5, 1968. Fifty years ago today, Senator Robert F. Kennedy was shot in the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. He died a day later. Kennedy had just won the California presidential primary. This was a moment that changed history. Author and journalist Jeff Greenfield worked for Senator Kennedy as a speechwriter, was in the Ambassador Hotel the night of that shooting, and he has a new piece in the Daily Beast, how RFK could have become president. Jeff, it's great to have you here with us. Thanks so much. Before Good we to get to the you. article, which is like catnip for a political junkie, I just want to ask, you know, what was that moment like to be in the Ambassador Hotel, to be lifted from the heights of the win of the California primary to ultimately what happened? It was just as you describe it, and it was in an instant. Um, we were gathered in the, on the fifth floor in the living room of his suite, staffers, supporters, uh, just watched him in that ebullion, almost joyous proclamation of victory. And literally within a minute, the, the television screens shifted to the chaos. Uh, and there was this just total stunned, um, you know, I don't know. See, I don't even have the words 50 right. years later. Uh, it was just that moment from joy to complete grief and, and sorrow. For so many of us who have grown up after that, looking at these pictures, you sort of uh, live under the assumption, well, Kennedy had just won the California primary. Of course, he was going to go on to Chicago, as he said, and wrap up the Democratic nomination. But this wonderful piece you wrote in the Daily Beast sort of says, not so fast. Remind us of what challenges existed had this horrible event never happened. Well, you have to go back half a century and realize that the political terrain and the rules were totally different. Most delegates weren't picked in primaries. They were under the control of party leaders or bosses, most of whom in the big states were going to support Vice President Humphrey as they would have supported Lyndon Johnson. That's who they were. And so once California was over and then a kind of weird primary in New York two weeks later, there was no more turf where you could actually win votes. So the question was, how could Robert Kennedy then persuade, push, if you will, or as CBS newsman Roger Mudd put it, squeeze the delegates to move away from their establishment choice and go with Bobby. And the idea was go all over the country, draw enormous crowds, and have them back in their home states tell the Democratic leaders, this is the guy. And the second part was, assuming someone like Chicago Mayor Richard Daley uh, would have endorsed Bobby Kennedy, which seems probable now, he would have been a signal to other leaders, look, we got to pick a guy who can beat Richard Nixon, and Robert Kennedy's that guy. But it would have been tough. A couple things that you bring up in this article, which are so fascinating. Would RFK have ever accepted the number two slot? Would he have ever run as vice president? Well, th this is something that his de facto campaign manager, Fred Dutton, said to me just a couple of days before the primary. He was somewhat pessimistic about the nomination. He said, well, you know, if he's offered the nomination with Hubert Humphrey, he'll take it. And I, I said, well, we've been running against this guy and his policies. And Fred Dutton said, look, Bobby's a Roman. He'll go where the power is. That was his point of view. Um, one thing you can, you can sort of speculate if you want to play this out is if Robert Kennedy were alive and competing, um, would Richard Nixon have chosen Spiro Agnew? Mm -hmm. Or would he have chosen someone more like Kennedy, like New York Mayor John Lindsay? I mean, the, the, the wheels that keep turning sure. about alternate histories are almost endless. And, and you bring up Nixon, but another key player in this would have been Lyndon Baines Johnson uh -huh. and J. Edgar Hoover. You know, two foes, two just giant political enemies of Robert Kennedy. And you suggest that maybe, just maybe, he would have been able to neutralize them. How? Well, this is the, uh, I devoted a part of a whole book to this where you're able to just do fiction. But it's possible that, you know, maybe the Kennedy forces had information on J. Edgar Hoover in his life that would have been embarrassing to Hoover. Maybe they knew about how Lyndon Johnson became a multimillionaire on the government payroll. But I still think that if you look back on history and if Robert Kennedy survives, the opposition of a, of a sitting Democratic president and the FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, still would have been enormously difficult um, obstacles to overcome. Uh, lastly, Jeff, you know, what are the lessons that Robert Kennedy could perhaps teach the Democrats going forward right now? This was a guy who made a famous trip to Appalachia uh, and yet who was just mobbed wherever he went in the cities. Yeah, 50 years is a long time to try to tease out the politics. But one thing is clear. Even back in 68, the coalition of Democrats, blacks, Hispanics, white working class was fracturing. Uh, had been going on for years, not just in the South but in the big cities. And, and in the last weeks of the campaign, 
Robert Kennedy was looking very hard for how do you keep the coalition together. He was tilting toward a kind of liberal populist message about rich folks not paying their fair share of taxes. There's no way to know whether he could have held that coalition together. But I think what we saw in 2016, the complete collapse of that coalition, the wholesale desertion of the white, of the white working class away from Democrats, uh, is an indication of what Robert Kennedy was trying to say about we've got to heal these divisions. And that lesson, I think, still resonates even across half a century. Jeff Greenfield, an honor to get to speak to you about this. Thanks so much. Good luck to you, John. Appreciate it.